Hello, and welcome to the New York Jewish Film Festival. The festival is presented by the Jewish Museum and Film at Lincoln Center. I'm Aviva Weintraub from the Jewish Museum, and it's a real pleasure to have with us Carl Ludwig Rettinger, the director of the Red Orchestra. And we are going to have a conversation about this fascinating film. Welcome to you, Carl. And perhaps we can start with you telling us how you came to make the film and what was it about the story that interested you so much? Yeah, of course. Uh, the German history is for my generation a very important topic. And I learned of this group just quite a while ago. It's, it's uh, 20 years ago. And um, it's a topic where people don't know about really in Germany, but also in abroad, because I filmed in Belgium, where part of the group and in Paris and even Tel Aviv. Uh, and people don't know about this resistance group. And this was one reason. And even more, you see, in Western Germany, uh, the Red Orchestra was uh, blamed to, they gave some military information, some of them, to the Allies and to the Russian Secret Service. And so they were really the bad guys. So the kind of military um, um, group around Stauffenberg who tried to kill uh, Hitler, they were the fine guys. And this group, they were the bad guys because they were the traitors. And I think that's not fair. And so I thought it's very important to, to do a film about them because there were a, a, a very large net from, a loose net from resistance circles uh, during the Nazi regime. And they really tried to do something against it. They did a lot of activities like uh, spreading uh, uh, flyers and uh, pay, uh, um, uh, putting uh, flyers on the walls. Um, and they, they helped people uh, uh, to get out of the countries like Jews and so on. But also there, were the, there was another group under the same name, the Red Orchestra. They, at the beginning, they didn't know from each other who was a kind of a spy net, which was launched by the Secret Service of the Soviet Union. But the head of this, uh, uh, Leopold Trepper, he was uh, in Palestine before, and he was kicked out by the British uh, troops. And he selected a lot of resistance fighters in Belgium and in France who were Jews coming from, left-wing Jews coming from Palestine. And they did this uh, uh, group in Paris and, and uh, Belgium. So it's a, a quite complex uh, story. And I was also very fascinated by him because it's not about victims. You saw, there are so many films about the victims of the Nazi regimes and the Holocaust. But here we have people who were active, who fought against resistance fighters, who fought, fought against it. And this was interesting for me. And you made a decision. Um, you set up a very fascinating structure in the film. It's quite complicated um, the way you tell the story through um, some focusing on films that were produced in one in West Germany and one in East Germany in the early 1970s. Was it always your idea to use those films to help tell the story? Actually, at the beginning, when I heard of this group, I thought you cannot make a film about it because you don't have pictures. If you are underground, you don't do photographs, you see. There, there is n only one little piece of uh, a, 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 a 16 millimeter amateur uh, film, very short, a, a few minutes. 
and that's it. So you you could only do a talking heads film of grandchildren talking about their grandparents who did this. And this was, I was not interested in this. This would be too dry for me, yeah. So, but then I found during research, I was interested in this topic. I had some other works to do in the meantime, but anyway, I found about these two uh, fiction productions. And then I thought, this is interesting. On one hand, I can use these fiction scenes to uh, tell the story in a more vivid way. And on the same time to reflect on the reception, on the historical reception and interpretation of the story after the war, during the Cold War, because it was a part of the propaganda thing between East and West. Of course, this is um, on paper and in your mind, this is easy, it's attractive. Yeah, everybody I told, it was a great pitch but if you are editing, you are in a big problem because it's a contradiction on one hand to tell a story in an emotional and in a true way. And at the same time to reflect more or less, the, it, it's, it, it was very hard to edit anyway. Yeah. But I, I think you did an incredible job with the editing. And um, I noticed that, for instance, you use the visual language of the feature films, and then you sometimes pick it up even in the contemporary um, footage, like architecture, uh, window frames, door frames, and human gestures like sitting and turning. It really, it's, I think it's a masterful edit. Yeah, what is interesting is that the shot part of the films on the original locations and we went to the original locations too with some of the uh, uh, descendants of the people who, who've been involved and so you, you you let's say in brussels we've been at the house where this uh, where the all the transmitting of the messages to moscow were, were be done and in the 70s, in 1970, both teams from Eastern Germany and, and, and Western Germany shot there just with a few months, uh, uh, within a few months in summer. And then we went to the same house and talked with the owner who didn't know about the backstory, but then he found out. So, uh, um, and therefore there is a connection, of course. And, and yeah, we tried let's say for people who just want to have the history, the story, and they want to be told not in a very theoretical way uh, or scientific way, we try to tell the story that people can identify and can be emotionally involved. But for those who have a cineastic or historical background, we put on top this kind of reflective thing which was fun and difficult at the same time yeah yeah I, it's i think it's a remarkable film because you convey so much information and at the same time the pacing is is very exciting you always want to know um what will happen next it looks like the two films the east german film and the west german tv series came out maybe one year apart. Do you yes, think that true. one of them was made as a reaction to learning that the other was filming? I think it started earlier already, let's say middle end of the 60s. So in, in Western Germany, there were some first public uh, books uh, and paper articles about the Red Orchestra and uh, dealing there was they were traitors and they were all communists it was a it was a group of communists but also a lot of social democrats and other uh, uh, people involved so so it was very one-sided 
And so there was a kind of reaction coming from East Germany, but also from the, from the Soviet Union. They said, we have uh, to tell the story from our point of view, but they also used it in a propagandistic way because they said this resistance group in uh, uh, Berlin, it was the kind, they were the first people working for the big brother in uh, the Soviet Union, you know, so they are like the Stasi. They, they helped us to uh, uh, fight against the fascists. So they used it also in a propaganda manner. So actually it was only after the reunification in Germany where the history the historical background of the Red Orchestra was really thoroughly researched. And you could do this film only with this, and it takes a while. It's also interesting that the most important and most popular book on the, on the topic was um, published by an, an American historian, by uh, Anne Nelson. I think she is, um, I don't know which university, so it came from abroad because still it was so difficult. But, uh, and this was also one reason for me to do this film because as we see today, it's not enough that you put the two parts of Germany together, everything is fine. We learn now uh, with all these political involvements that we also have to find a, a history, history uh, telling, uh, which which is for both parts. You know, uh, we have to to bring together the perspectives. It's on one hand fruitful, but it's also quite difficult because still uh, a lot of people have prejudice. Yes, it's and I have to say I don't want to speak too specifically about the ending. Yeah and give a spoiler, but um, once the Cold War comes into the picture in a strong way, it's, it's very, for me, it was a, a real twist, uh, surprising end. Um, but maybe we shouldn't talk yeah, about I it. I mean, at least you can say history is written by the people who survive. You see, yes. that's... Yes. Uh, what's happening and it takes a long, long time. And it was one of the, uh, Hans Koppi, who is the son of one of the main members of, of the Red Orchestra group in Berlin. He's a historian. He grew up in Eastern Germany, but he was working also for a new Insti Institute for Resistance Research in uh, uh, Berlin after the reunification. And he is really, he worked a lot uh, because he also was, as you can see in the films, emotionally so involved to keep the heritage uh, alive. And he was, of course, for me, very important. Uh, without him, I could have never done this film. And he, he gave a lot of contacts to people in Tel Aviv, in Paris, in New York, even there's one uh, uh, person in the film. And uh, so this, this was the reason. So sometimes it takes long. And I think that's our task as documentary filmmakers. It's not just to tell important stories, but also to keep, to document stories and to keep history uh, for the generations to come. Absolutely. Um, I, I was very moved by the interviews as well, the contemporary interviews. Um, the people you found who were the descendants of some of the Red Orchestra members, um, they, first of all, they seemed so knowledgeable and uh, eager to learn and to share the stories that they knew. Some of them learned stories from hearing, let's say, um, their grandparents speak about it. Um, was it. Was it hard to find people who were willing to speak about their ancestors in this way? 
not not really um, because again uh, Hans Koppi he helped me a lot it was the first task was to convince him and to to somehow to work with him on the concept and so on and um, then this was very helpful and also I think the descendants even if it's two generations by Hans Koppi he's the first uh, generation of but even two generations they are still very much affected uh, if they are sensible enough you know to to realize it um, so they are they are interested to deal with this uh, uh, topic and it was not a problem to convince them they were really willing uh, uh, to do this yeah. well the the interviews with um, dr. copy are really very powerful and um, in fact, that's how you open the film with, with Dr. Yeah. Coffey speaking about, and am I correct that he lives across the street from the site? Um, no, no, no okay. that's, that's, that's a, something just to, actually it was the last scene we, sh we shot. We shot it after the whole film was more or less edited uh, okay. because we felt we need to open this film with him. So we shot this scene with him. And um, you see, actually, the interviews with him were the most difficult because he was used to talk so much about it. And also his historical research, it was triggered by his personal involvement, but it was also a way for him not to be too much harmed by it. I mean, he grew up, uh, or he was born in prison and his mother was killed half a year later. You have to deal with it all your life. So I really wanted him, I did not talk with him, but I wanted to give him the possibility during our work to open up emotionally it was this was very important for me during the film and uh, at the beginning he was very much on the information level and and so and slowly and you can see this in the course of the film he's opening up more and more and i'm very glad and 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 thankful that he opened up for this film. I think this is very important. Yeah. yeah, it's beautiful that he was able to share it and, and such a sad story. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's on a way, it's in a way a sad story, but with him and with the descendants of Gorevich, uh, um, there's, a slightly positive ending you could you could say yes but um, of course we the film at the beginning you see i thought the job is very easy i have two heroes yeah and i tell this kind of heroic story but it's as we if you go deeper into it you learn how difficult it is i mean if you try to find against hitler with the secret service together with the secret service of Stalin, then, I mean, you can see, they try to get in contact with the British, they try to get in contact with the Americans and they failed, they did not want to su support them. And still they said, we need to do something against Hitler. And as we see it now, the only possibility is that Germany will be defeated from outside. So you you are, what is the English term, between a rock and a hard place. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And that's really something, I think that's, that's interesting. Also, even for us today, uh, today, as we can see, all the populist movements, uh, 
uh, growing in, in Western societies where we thought, hey, impossible. I mean, there will not be anybody trying to establish fascistoid structures again. So you can learn what it means really to fight against this in the last consequence. I mean, that's really, that's something which was important for me too. And has your film been shown in Germany yet? Not yet. I mean, there will be a cinema release. But at the moment, uh, we wanted to start it last May. There was a, a shutdown in May. Then we said, OK, let's start in November. <laughs> there yeah. was a shutdown again. Then we said, OK, it will be end of February. And I doubt that the cinemas will be open. So it's, it's hard to tell. But yeah. there's also a TV version. So it will be, so I think the cinema version will be published late spring. And then there's a, a, a TV version which will be shown um, in Arte. It's a French German channel, public channel in Germany too, and in Belgium. Um, and probably, we hope so, in Israel too. Yeah. And I'm curious about the the older films from the 70s. Were those very widely seen? Do you know? Um, the the um, East German film was one of the biggest films ever done in East Germany. And we did test screenings. And it was important for me to invite people who were born in uh, East Germany to them, and some of them, older ones, remembered. It's, the actors are very well known. The film is shot on 70 millimeters, so it's the, um, still the film, if you see it today in cinema, it's not a masterpiece, yeah. But we, we uh, inspired the rights holders, which is the Defa Stiftung, to restore the film, so they, it took them two years to restore the film. So the the, the quality, if you see it on a on a, a screen, which of course you cannot do now, maybe at any later moment would be nice. The the visuals are incredible, yeah. Um, but this film has been it's in release uh, uh, in DVD, so, so uh, it will be seen from time to time. The West German series is a different kind of thing. Actually, it was a co-production of the public television in West Germany and public television in France. And um, they, the, the representation of the Gestapo is quite yeah it's 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 not positive if you can you can tell but i mean it's not really they are the clever guys who hunt down these bad uh resistance fighters i mean it's a bit this is it, it's more subtle that than that and they knew it already let's say if one two years after the the series has been done hey we did not a good job because there were a lot of critics. So this series was shown once, also it was very, very expensive. And then it was hidden in the poison cabinet of the archive and everybody forgot about it. And it was very hard for me to get hold of it. It was really not easy. Yeah, and we did a proper, um, we, we, we got from the producers is Bavaria in Munich. We got the negative and we did, uh, um, there was only a, a beta a SD version. Also, it has been shot uh, in 35 millimeters. So for all the excerpts, we did uh, a transfer ourselves. Um, for my last question, I wonder if we can make a connection to an earlier film that you produced um, called Gantz, How I Lost My Beetle, um, which tells the story of Joseph Gantz, who was a, um, a 
German Jew and yeah. really responsible, for, well, Engineer, you can tell, yeah. <laughs> um, for the, the he, very uh, famous was, Volkswagen. He actually put together the concept. First, he created the idea there should not be only the big cars expensive cars for the rich people. We need to have a small car for just normal people that they can travel. This will help the, the average people to develop blah, blah, blah. So it was more or less the same idea like uh, Ford had in the, the US. And uh, he, all the technical devices which later became the Beetle, the, the uh, aer aerodynamic form, and, and I cannot tell you in detail, was done by him, by Joseph Gans. But he, and, and he presented this, he even had a, a prototype shown on the motor car exhibition, uh, 1933, four days after Hitler came to power. And Hitler went, saw it, and he was fascinated. And, but then later people told him, hey, you, 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 cannot, you cannot give him the, the order to do this car. He's Jewish. So they put him into prison. They wanted him to give up his, uh, how do you say, pa patent in Germany? You, yes, his patent. Yeah, patent. And he didn't do it. He, he was because it was at the a very early stage of the Nazi regime. He came out of prison. He flew to Switzerland. And then uh, Hitler told Porsche, you do this Volkswagen. So that's the story. It's not known in Germany, not at all. Uh, and uh, we co-produced a film together with Dutch, uh, a Dutch company. Yeah, yeah Dutch I, company. I mention it because, well, first of all, in the US, people can watch it on Amazon Prime. So it's accessible. Um, but it occurred to me that your um, you're taking in in both the uh, Volkswagen Beetle film Gantz and the Red Orchestra. You're taking um, a subject where people maybe think they know um, what the history of something was, and you're showing how it's very complex and very interesting. Um, yeah, you see. Uh, let's say it like this. I'm very fascinated of these historical topics and I think it's also uh, important for us to talk about these, these uh, uh, things to get a better idea about history. But what is strange with television, uh, especially mainstream television, so when I, when I go to a department, even a primetime department of public TV, I had this story of a of the first person who walked through North America, Cabeza, a, a Spanish guy. It, it, it took him uh, nearly 10 years. He walked from one tribe to the next and a lot of struggles. I think a fascinating idea. And I went to a prime time department. It's such an adventurous idea, very attractive. And they told me, hey, nobody knows about this story. And I said, yes, but that's exactly why I want to tell it. And they say, no, that's not good. You only tell story people know about. So they do the 10th version of Cortes uh, searching for gold for or, or El Dorado, you know. So uh, uh, that's strange. And it is a bit uh, of television, too, that it's just, how do you say, reaffirming the cliches we all have in mind. And of course, it's, it's, it's good for me it, that I try to, to do something against it and to tell the stories people don't know. And yeah, you are not mainstream, but there are still the niches where you can uh, uh, show these films. And I think with art and the different TV stations involved, it will be one or two million people to watch this film. So that's okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for the film. And thank you so much for taking part in this conversation today. 
Yeah, thanks a lot for your interest in the film and to uh, present this film to American audience. And I hope that there might be a chance later at your uh, uh, Lincoln Center, there might be a possibility to show the film on, on screen, which would be great, of course. But so good luck for your festival. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you.